belong to Mongols. That's why the Mughal Empire was uh, given to name. It was de- uh, derived from uh, Mongol word. Babur eliminated Delhi Sultanate after defeating Ibrahim Lodi. Don't you mean the Mongol Empire? Oh, me from the past. That reminds me of the time that you conflated the word fort with the word forte, which of course you pronounced fort. But on this occasion, you aren't entirely wrong. The Mughals were kind of the Mongols, but we'll get to that in a minute. So the Mughals were Muslims who created an empire in India that held power for roughly 200 years between the early 16th and early 18th centuries, although technically the Mughal Empire didn't come to an end until after the Indian Rebellion against the British in 1857. Now the Mughals weren't the first Muslims in India, those would have been merchants, and they weren't even the first Muslims to rule significant parts of India. That honor goes to the Delhi Sultanate, which began in 1206 in northern India. But the Delhi Sultanate didn't last very long, and was replaced by a bunch of regional kingdoms, and one of them, the Lodi, Sultanate had the misfortune of falling to the founder of the Mughal dynasty, Babur, in 1526. Not Babar, although that would have been awesome. Babur was descended from Timur, the last great Central Asian conqueror in the Mongol tradition, and also from Chinggis Khan, which explains why Babur and his followers are called the Mughals. It's the Persian Arabic word for Mongols. Now I know what you're saying, something like 12% of human beings currently living in the world are descended from Chinggis Khan, but Babur got it on the ground floor of it. Anyway, I think we have some footage of Babur raiding the Lodi Sultanate, don't we, Stan? Nah, I don't feel like that was actual file footage from 1206. I feel like that was a racist Hercules movie from Italy in the 1950s. So the Mughal Empire is really important in India's cultural history. I mean, the Taj Mahal was built during this time in architecture and painting. We see a blending of Indian and Persian styles that demonstrate how cosmopolitan the empire was. But probably the most important aspect of the Mughals, at least as far as the contemporary world is concerned, is that they consolidated Muslim rule over much of India, and they're largely the reason that today there are so many Indians who are also Muslims. And the Mughals were also a really interesting example of like how to build and maintain an empire. Alright, let's go to the thought bubble. Muslims were a small minority ruling class vastly outnumbered by Hindus, and like many empires, they relied on military power and pursued expansionist policies. Like most of the Mughal rulers, especially Akbar and Aurangzeb, spent a considerable amount of time trying to extend Mughal control over the entire Indian subcontinent, and they created a pretty effective empire. They were able to incorporate Indian princes into the ruling class while still retaining top positions for Muslims. They reorganized the bureaucracy and instituted an effective tax collection system, which was important because the empire was, of course, very expensive to run, as empires always are. This meant it was important to make accurate tax assessments, and taxes were usually collected by local leaders called zamindars. Taxes had to be paid in cash, and this contributed to the growing commercialization of the Mughal Empire. Reliance on zamindars, who were important men in their communities, meant that the empire could collect revenue without being too disruptive to local village life. And although almost all of the revenue came from taxes on agriculture, the Mughals also taxed trade. Another way that the Mughals were a typical empire is that their rulers engaged in building projects to enhance their prestige. From Persepolis to Rome to the Forbidden City, building monuments to one's greatness is what emperors do, and the Mughals were no exception. As Muslims, many of their building projects were mosques, but the Mughals also built forts and, most spectacularly, mausoleums. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So most history classes that mention the Mughals focus on the contrast contrast between Akbar and Aurangzeb. Akbar comes off as a good ruler, and Aurangzeb is painted as the guy who ruined the empire. The typically positive historian's view of Akbar, who ruled from 1556 until 1605, can be summed up in this quote from Asher and Talbot's India Before Europe. Through his reforms of administration and taxation, Akbar created a sound and enduring foundation for Mughal governance, while his tolerant attitude and inclusive policies toward Hindus and Jains helped create a state that was more Indian in character. That tolerance aspect is especially important. Like, Akbar rescinded the jizya, the tax that non-Muslims had to pay, and in 1580 he gave all non-Muslims the same rights as Muslims, instituting a policy called sul i which translates to universal toleration. Now, in part, this policy was designed to lessen the power of Muslim religious scholars who might have been disturbed by the way that Akbar blended Islamic and Indian ideas of kingship, especially the idea that he was, you know, kind of a little bit divine. Slightly problematic idea 
idea to a lot of Muslim scholars, given that the foundation of the Islamic faith is the statement, there is no god but God, but yeah, yeah, you know. In addition to the Sully Kuhl, Akbar built his reputation for toleration by sponsoring discussions of religion and philosophy. He even commissioned a building for religious discussions, the Ibadat Khana, where Muslims and Brahmins and Zoroastrians, Jains, Christians, all of them could talk theology. Akbar's support for intellectual pursuits are the kinds of things that modern historians like, and it's not all that surprising that he's remembered so favorably. Historians are far less kind to Akbar's grandson, Aurangzeb, who ruled from 1658 until 1707. This is partly due to the work of J. N. Sakar, who promoted the idea that Aurangzeb built an Islamic state that discriminated against Hindus and other non-Muslims, which in turn led to a loss of unity across the Indian subcontinent and eventually the decline of the empire. And it's true that by the time of Aurangzeb's death in 1707, the Mughals were losing control over their empire. I mean, the stark reality of that decline came in 1757 when the British East India Company established itself permanently in Bengal and began its inexorable efforts to colonize all of India. But that was, you know, 50 years after Aurangzeb died, so maybe he shouldn't get all of the blame. In fact, whether these guys deserve their reputations really depends both on what aspects of their reign you look at and how you interpret them. As conquerors, Akbar and Aurangzeb had a lot in common. Like, Akbar might have sponsored high-minded discussion, but he was also willing to use extreme violence to keep his subjects in line. For example, he slaughtered thousands of inhabitants of the fort at Chitor and ordered his generals to pile up the skulls of Indian princes to frighten them into submission. That's not especially tolerant. And here's another detail about Akbar's rule that's meant to paint him as a modern, enlightened ruler. Because he was interested in science, Akbar arranged an experiment. He had infants moved to a special house where no person was to talk to them so that the natural language of mankind might be revealed. The experiment failed, but it is a reflection of Akbar's desire to explore in a scientific manner the nature of humans and what he believed to be their common condition. Now you can read that as a leader trying to understand the underlying connections among all humans, no matter their religious backgrounds. Or you can read it as horrifying child abuse. And then we have Aurangzeb, who was a devout Muslim and did try to introduce Islamic principles into Mughal rule, but the trend toward orthodoxy and away from Akbar's toleration had begun long before with his predecessor, Shah Jahan. He's best known for building the Taj Mahal. Good work. Stan, he built it by himself? Oh, apparently he had some help. But the maintenance of the Taj Mahal took all the revenue from 30 villages, and maybe Aurangzeb's orthodoxy was less important than his desire to appear to be a sober and frugal leader. Aurangzeb was also accused of destroying temples in 1669, although in fact they were just damaged, and this was primarily done to send a political message to opponents, not as an act of religious orthodoxy. He also tried to limit expenses at court by prohibiting the use of gold in men's garments, and he stopped the traditional practice of being weighed against gold on his birthday. Unlike Akbar, who is seen as being a patron of the arts, Aurangzeb is remembered for getting rid of court musicians and poets, but he got rid of them because of financial constraints. Well, and also because of his interpretation of Islamic law. And that last point interests me. For those who want to see him negatively, Aurangzeb's orthodox Islam had no room for musicians or poets. But it's also possible to see that decision as a prudent cost-saving measure. Here's another detail from Aurangzeb's life that's been used to paint him as a zealot. Aurangzeb unlike his predecessors, was buried in a simple outdoor grave rather than an elaborate and expensive tomb. You could see that as a symbol of religious faith, or as a sign of humility, or an attempt by a thoughtful ruler to spare his subjects the expenses of, like, keeping up his tomb. That said, in the long run, the Taj Mahal has done pretty well in terms of generating tourist money, whereas I don't think anyone's paying to see Aurangzeb's grave. But the thing is, Aurangzeb needed to save money. If he was a bad ruler, it's mostly because he spent so much time and treasure fighting rebellions in the south of his empire, and then neglected the north where unrest grew as well. It's overly simplistic to say that the glory days of the Mughal Empire were about tolerance, and the downfall was about intolerance. Really, there were lots of factors that played into the decline of the Mughal Empire, including growing factionalism at the Mughal court, the rise of regional powers, and the breakdown of the system of governance by local nobles. Historians are in the business of making claims about what happened and supporting those claims 
with evidence. And often, this evidence provides the details that make reading and learning about history so much fun. Now, sometimes the details suggest only one interpretation, but in many cases, they can lead us to multiple conclusions. And the reigns of Akbar and Aurangzeb provide good examples of why we need to be careful with our details. It's possible that Aurangzeb was a terrible ruler because he tried to impose Muslim orthodoxy on a Hindu majority, and no doubt many Hindus felt so, especially after he reinstituted the jizya. And he did try to introduce Sharia law as the governing principle in the empire. But it's also possible that Aurangzeb's bad reputation comes from a contemporary preference for tolerance over piety in our rulers, or from a general feeling that states are better ruled by secular than religious laws, or from the fact that it's just hard to rule a declining empire well. Ask President Obama. Our experiences and biases make us more likely to see the dismissal of court musicians and poets as an example of religious fanaticism than as, like, a cost-saving measure. And maybe Akbar, who could be as brutal in his military conquests as any emperor, comes out in a good light because he did advocate religious toleration. But it wasn't totally or even primarily due to his religious tolerance that Akbar was able to win most of his wars. And the many rebellions against his reign suggest that he wasn't as popular with his subjects as he is today with historians. One last note about how the way that we look at the past can shape the present and vice versa. We need to be particularly careful here because the Mughals continued to play an important role in how Indians imagine themselves today. One of the roots of contemporary Hindu nationalism is pride at India's throwing off the shackles of imperialism, and for many Hindu nationalists, that history of imperialism starts not with the British, but with the Mughals. We often use history to define ourselves today, and one of the most common ways to do that is to make negative claims about the people that we say we are not. And so when we look at historical figures, we need to be conscious of the fact that we are looking at them. And then the last king was Badr Shah Zafar. 1887 کہ بہادر شاہ زفر کی وفات کے بعد اس کی اولاد کو لال قلعہ خالی کرنا ہوگا لیکن فطرت شاید انتقام لینے کا فیصلہ کر چکی تھی اور سور کی چربی سے تیار ہونے والے کارتوس کا وہ مشہور واقعہ جو کہ انگریزوں اور مسلمانوں کے درمیان جنگ آزادی کا سبب بنا سامنے آگئے جس کے بارے میں ایک انگریز مصنف لکھتا ہے کہ ہمیں اس جنگ میں تار برکی نے بچا لیا اور ہمارا پیغام رسانی کا نظام ہمارے حریفوں کے مقابلے میں کہیں زیادہ تیز تھا وگرنہ ہندوستان ہمارے ہاتھوں سے نکلا جا رہا تھا جب انگریزوں نے اپنی جدید سائنسی اور حربی ایجادات کی بدولت جنگ آزادی جس کو انگریز جنگ غدر کے نام سے یاد کرتا ہے میں فتح حاصل کر لی تو آخری بوڑے مغل تاجدار بہادر شاہ زفر کو قید کر کے رنگون لے جائے گئے معذول بادشاہ یہ جان چکا تھا کہ اب اسے دفن کے لیے اپنے وطن کی سرزمین حاصل نہیں ہو سکے سو اس کا یہ شیر کہ کتنا ہے بد نصیب زفر دفن کے لیے دو گز زمین بھی نہ ملی کوئے یار میں پیشگوئی کی صورت سچ ثابت ہو رنگون کے قیامت خیز اور ظلم و بربریت سے بھرپور یہ لمحات بھی تاریخ کا حصہ ہے جب ناشتے میں معذول بادشاہ کو اس کے نوجوان بیٹوں اور پوتوں کے سر پیش کیے گئے بہادر شاہ پر مقدمہ چلایا گیا جو کہ اپنی انیس سماعتوں کے ساتھ اکتالیس دن تک جاری رہا اور بلاخر مجرم ٹھہراتے ہوئے اسے قید کر دیا گیا جو کہ ستاسی سال کی عمر میں اٹھارہ سو باسٹ میں دوران قید ہی انتہائی بے بسی اور قسم پرسی کے عالم میں اس جہان فانی سے کوچھ کر گیا بہادر شاہ زفر کی چار بیویوں میں سے بیس بیٹے اور بتیس بیٹیاں تھے ناظرین محترم اس کے بعد شہنشاہ ہند زہیر الدین بابر سے لے کر بہادر شاہ زفر تک کی اولادیں یعنی شہزادے اور شہزادیاں بقول میاں محمد بخش لکھی وال نہ ملدہ جسدہ اج کک کھاندے ملدہ کہ مصداق اس تکلیف دے حالت میں زندگی گزارنے پر مجبور ہوئیں کہ وہ شہزادیاں جن کو کبھی چشم فلک نے بھی بے پردہ نہیں دیکھا تھا میں سے کچھ اپنی ہی عوام کی خادمائے مقرر ہوئیں اور کچھ نے توائف کا داغ اپنے چہرے پر سجا لیا جبکہ بیٹے دنیا کی بھیڑ میں تلاش رزق کرتے کرتے رزق خاک ہو کر رہ گئے ناظرین گرامی اہد مغلیہ کے عروج و زوال کی یہ داستان امید ہے نہ صرف آپ کو پسند آئے گی بلکہ آپ اسے سمانے عبرت کے طور پر لیتے ہوئے دوستوں کے ساتھ شیئر کر کے ہمیں اپنی آراز سے بھی آگاہ کریں گے 
so i will discuss now the what were the reasons of downfall of the mughal empire it is the end of the 17th century the mughal empire reached its zenith it was extended to over 4 million square kilometers of land to over nearly all of the indian subcontinent territories including parts of afghanistan the empire was one of the biggest to have existed in the indian subcontinent being compared even with the mauryan empire which existed 2000 years before the mughals the mughal empire is often considered the golden age period of india during this era its gdp in 1600 was around 22 percent of the world's economy the second largest in the world at that time by 1700 it had risen to 24 percent and was the world's largest economy it was a gigantic structure not only by land but by manpower and production it is believed that 25 percent of the world's industrial output was here but afterwards it crumbled and we can ask The Mughal Empire was founded by a guy named Babur. In his full name, Zahir Uddin Muhammad Babur, a Central Asian ruler who was descended from the Turko Mongol conqueror Timur by his father's side, and from Chagatai, the second son of the Mongol ruler Genghis Khan on his mother's side. He was descendant of two dynasties which were part of the Mongol Empire. That's why their name was Mughals which really meant Mongols in Persian Arabic, and he will start a new dynasty. Babur came from Central Asia, today's Afghanistan, and turned his attention to India. He advanced, and after the victory of Pani Prat in 1526, the gates of a new land were open. This was the beginning of the Mughal Empire and the end of the Delhi Sultanate. Wars, conflicts and campaigns occupied the time of the new rulers and instability increased. This was the point when the son of Babur, Humayun, was driven out of India into Persia and the Mughal rule was interrupted. It could have been the collapse at the time, but Humayun managed to create strong diplomatic relations with the Safavid dynasty of Persia and he returned in India. His son, Akbar, which will became known as Akbar the Great, managed to expand the Mughal Empire in every direction. A new class of nobility was established and government reforms were made. Akbar established a strong and more stable economy, leading to more money. Trade was made with Europeans, and even so this was an Islamic empire. Akbar allowed free expression of religion. He was a Muslim who took an interest in the Hindu and Christian faiths. For that time, these were modern reforms. One big weakness for the Mughals was their failure to create a peaceful transition from one ruler to another. Some potential rival princes were murdered when Shah Yahan succeeded to the throne. The taste for power was present and for many the throne was more important than their brothers. Shah Yahan's first son, Dara Shiko, would have become the ruler as a result of his father's illness. However, a younger son, Aurangzeb, allied with the Islamic side against his brother, was more influenced by a syncretism of Hindu-Muslim culture. Aurangzeb defeated Dara in 1659 and killed him. His father recovered from his illness, but Aurangzeb declared him incompetent to rule and had him imprisoned. He was a very controversial ruler. He treated his external enemies with great ferocity. During his reign, the empire gained its political strength and stability, and the empire was expanded to include territories in South India. In the Mughal territory, different cultures and religions were present. After his death in 1707, many parts of the empire revolted. It seems that Aurangzeb was the core of stability in his time. He managed to hold his empire together and united, even if he was considered very controversial. 
His religious intolerance undermined the stability of the Mughal society, in which many other religions were present, but some historians are debating this. It seems that he employed significantly more Hindus in his imperial bureaucracy, and even married a Hindu princess. Anyhow, at the beginning of the 18th century, the empire was big, but had its revolts and small spots of instability, marked by religious conflicts and murders in the administration. His death was followed by a war of succession again among his three sons. It ended in the victory of Shah Alam, which attempted to reform the administration again. His death in 1712 put the Mughal dynasty into huge political instability and violence. Until 1719, four emperors ascended the throne, showing that the things were not going well. The structure was a Sikh giant. People like the Rajputs, the Marathas, the Sikhs were enraged. The instability increased the power of the nobles. In the different factions, supported rivals to the throne in order for them to occupy high positions. For example, before 1719, one of the kings was controlled by nobles and could manage to rule only for one year. The next king was controlled too, and he didn't represent the real authority behind the Mughal power. When he tried to free himself from their control, he was killed. The rivalry among the various factions of the nobility has disintegrated the empire, and some powerful and ambitious nobles established some independent states. The condition of India with its incompetent rulers suggested to the people that the Mughals are not the power it once been. This attracted attention and also foreign invaders. Muhammad Shah came to power. In this time, a great danger came from the west. Nadir Shah attacked Punjab. Muhammad was easily defeated and imprisoned. Delhi was captured, where thousands were killed. The this invasion was a crucial blow to its dynasty. He was succeeded by a number of inefficient rulers. In 1761, during the reign of Shah Alam II, Ahmad Shah Abdali, the independent ruler of Afghanistan, invaded India. He conquered Punjab and marched towards Delhi. By this time, the Marathas had extended their influence up to Delhi too, and the war between the Marathas and Ahmad Shah Abdali was inevitable. In this territory of India, new powers were growing, and this put what remained of the Mughals into the shadow. In the early 18th century, the Maratha Empire extended suzerainty over the Indian subcontinent. In the next years, the Mughals were more like a dynasty without the empire they once had. They wanted the protection of the Emir of Afghanistan. Then, the Marathas captured Delhi, and they officially became the protectors of the Emperor, and afterwards, British East India Company became the protectors of the Mughal dynasty. By 1857, was under the East Indian Company's control. Britain was expanding here. The last Mughal, Bahadur Shah Zafar, was deposed by the British East India Company and exiled in 1858 due to his incursions against the British rule. This marked the end of the Mughals. Historians have offered numerous explanations for the rapid collapse of the Mughal Empire between 1707 and 1720, which was after a century of growth and prosperity, it seems that conflicts were present in the interior, leading to instability, and the more aggressive Marathas were a real danger. Finally, came a series of violent political feuds over control of the throne, and after 1719, local Mughal successors states took power in region after region. The Mughal Empire is a good example as in other cases, showing us that an overstretched powerful structure from medieval times with different people, religions and traditions is more likely to fall if there is a lack of leadership. In these cases, the collapse is coming from the interior, instability is created and the structure cannot hold the dangers from outside. So, 
as <laughs> as the british are british are there so there is no muslim rule yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ghaznavis now attack now on you can say the worship place of the Hindus. What was the name of that? Somnath. Okay. Temple. So is there any justification of this invasion, this attack? How can you justify it? दोस्तों भारत में मध्ययुगीन काल में उससे पहले जितने भी मंदिरों में लूटमार हुई, तोड़फाड़ हुई, उसमें सबसे ज़्यादा जिसको याद किया जाता है वह सोमनाथ का मंदिर सोमनाथ का मंदिर गुजरात में है और इस सोमनाथ के मंदिर को महमूद गजनवी ने कई बार लूटा और उससे ये कहा जाता है कि मुसलमान राजाओं ने हिंदुओं के मंदिरों को हिंदू धर्म तोड़कर हिंदुओं के मंदिरों को तोड़कर हिंदू धर्म का अपमान किया इस पर मैंने कई जगह पे विस्तार पे बोला भी है कहा भी है मैं मुख्य बात आपके साथ ये समझना चाहता हूँ कि महमूद गजनवी ने इस मंदिर को लूटा निश्चित रूप से पर क्या उसका कारण धर्म था या उसका कारण संपत्ति की लालसा थी मैं आपके साथ पहले भी बात कर चुका हूँ कि राजाओं ने मंदिरों को लूटा वो हिंदू राजा भी होंगे मुसलमान राजा भी होंगे तो मंदिरों को तोड़ने के पीछे मंदिरों को लूटने के पीछे जो कारण थे वो कारण थे सत्ता के और संपत्ति के सोमनाथ के बारे में तो पूरा पूरा ये चीज़ संपत्ति से जुड़ा हुआ है महमूद गजनवी गजना से आता है जो बहुत दूर है सैकड़ों किलोमीटर हज़ारों किलोमीटर दूर है गजना सोमनाथ से वहाँ से वो आता है और जब वो आता है तो पहली बात नोट कीजिए कि उसकी फ़ौज में केवल मुसलमान नहीं है उसकी फ़ौज में पांच सेनापति हैं जो हिंदू हैं इनके नाम हैं तिलक सोंधी हरजान राय और हिंद आगे आता है वो रास्ते में हजारों मंदिर पड़े होंगे वो खुद दावा करता है कि वो सोमनाथ आ रहा है मूर्तियों को तोड़ने के लिए वो दावा करता है कि वो मूर्तियों को तोड़ने वाला राजा है मूर्तियों को मानने वाला राजा नहीं है पर आप देखिए कि जब वो गजना से लेके सोमनाथ आ रहा है तो रास्ते में हजारों मंदिर हैं उनकी मूर्तियों को वो नहीं तोड़ता उसका निशाना सोमनाथ पे क्यों कि क्यों है क्योंकि सोमनाथ का मंदिर एक धनी मंदिर था सोमनाथ के मंदिर में ऐसा अनुमान लगाया जाता है कि उस समय जो संपत्ति थी वो एक इक्यावन करोड़ के बराबर की थी जो बीस हजार सोने की दीनारों के रूप में थी और खैर महमूद गजनवी ने सोमनाथ को लूटा उसके पहले उसके रास्ते में एक आनंद पाल आता है आनंद पाल जो राजा था उसने टीपू सुल्तान की मदद की क्योंकि वो सत्ता का सवाल था वो टीपू सुल्तान के से हारना नहीं चाहता था तो आनंद पाल ने जो थानेश्वर का राजा था उसने महमूद गजनवी से समझौता किया तो ये फिर से हिंदू मुसलमान का मामला नहीं था लूटने वाली फौज में हिंदू भी थे मुसलमान भी थे संपत्ति उनके हाथ में आ गई और यहाँ लगे आज इतना बता दूँ कि सोमनाथ को जीतने के बाद एक हिंदू राजा को महमूद गजनवी ने सोमनाथ का इंचार्ज बनाया सोमनाथ का विभाग उसको दिया और वहाँ जो सिक्के चलाए गए उसकी लिखावट संस्कृत में है तो ये सब चीज़ों से पता चलता है कि हिंदू मुसलमान का मामला ना होकर एक अलग मामला था लगे हाथ यहाँ मैं दो चीज़ें और जोड़ दूँ कि जहाँ तक संपत्ति के लिए सवाल है तो कई हिंदू राजाओं ने भी मंदिरों को तोड़ा एक का उल्लेख मिलता है ग्यारहवीं शताब्दी की किताब राज तरंगिणी में कवि कल्याण अपनी किताब राज तरंगिणी में लिखते हैं कि राजा हर्षदेव जो कश्मीर के राजा थे इन्होंने मंदिरों से संपत्ति तोड़ने के लिए एक नए ओहदे का निर्माण किया जिसका नाम था देवोत्पतन नायक तो खैर ये हिंदू राजा था जो संपत्ति के लिए इस प्रकार से कर रहा था प्रोफेसर डी एन झा बताते हैं कि जब पुष्य मित्र शुंग आया उसने बुद्ध धर्म को समाप्त करना चाहा तो उसी के चलते उसने बहुत सारे बुद्ध विहारों पे हमला किया बहुत सारी चीज़ों को उसने आक्रमण किया मैंने आपको बताया कि जब मराठा सेनाएं टीपू सुल्तान पर आक्रमण करने गई 
उन्होंने भी श्रीरंगपट्टनम के मंदिर को तोड़ दिया तो मुख्य रूप से महमूद गजनवी जिस प्रकार का भी राजा हो वास्तव में वो अपने सत्ता के और संपत्ति के उद्देश्य से सोमनाथ तक आया और उसने वहाँ की मूर्तियों को तोड़ा और एक बहुत बड़ी संपत्ति को प्राप्त किया और उसके बाद एक हिंदू राजा को अपने प्रतिनिधि के रूप में सोमनाथ का राजा बनाया जब अब्बासी खलीफा कमजोर पड़े और शोरिशों और साजिशों के जरिए मुर्तद अहजाब जो थे उन्होंने हत्या के उन्हें नजरबंद भी कर लिया इन्होंने वागुजार कराया इसी वजह से इन्हें यमीन उदौला अमीन उल मिलत का खिताब मिला और ये हमेशा खलीफा बगदाद के ताबे रहे तीसरा ये था कि वो लोग यहाँ से जब भागते थे तो मुल्तान में आके जमा हो जाते थे यहाँ से शराबते फिर यहाँ से वो हिंदुओं के साथ मिल जाते थे आनंद पाल सबसे बड़ा था ये त्रिलोचन था ये सब लोग मिलकर मुतहदा जैसे आज एलाइड फोर्सेज है इसी तरह हमला आवर होते थे मगर महमूद गजनवी की कैफियत का हत्या के सोमनाथ के मंदिर के मंजर में भी बस मंजर में ये बड़ा वाज है कि महमूद शाह मंगरोली यहां पर मुल्तान के गुजरात काठियावाड़ में तो एक बेवा को बेवा आई जिसका अखलोता बेटा हिंदुओं ने मार दिया था तो उसका जवाब देने के लिए आए और वो जाके सोमनाथ काठियावाड़ में सोमनाथ के मंदिर में जाके बैठ गया और ये कैफियात है कि उन्होंने उन मनादिर को मंदिरों को जो साजिशों का गढ़ थे उनको फिर तोड़ जो टॉकिंग अबाउट नो रजिया सुल्तान नो दैट वेन शी बिकेम द रूल नो एंड देर वॉज नो दैट यू कैन सन इशू नो दैट इस्लाम डजेंट अलो अ वोमन नो to be the ruler of the muslim state no yes. or is clear or islam doesn't encourage any woman no or doesn't permit no or allow any woman to be the ruler no does it make any sense no it doesn't so how can we justify it in both cases if we say no it is not allowed so how can we say that if we say it, it is allowed no it doesn't make any difference no so what is the principle no of islam no on the basis of which no you can justify it when benazir bhutto no when she was elected as a prime minister of pakistan yeah, exactly. this issue was over there yeah. Yeah. now that so many scholars the muslim scholars that so many even the political parties no they start exploiting no the lady yeah that islam doesn't allow but the one who was no against benazir the same person was who at the chairman of kashmir committee malana fazlur rahman she accepted the same thing yeah maybe jibril came later on with new you know that revelation no yeah yeah Yeah, yeah, the, think, the, uh, the answer was in the question when you said they elected. The, it doesn't matter. Absolutely <laughs> right. When you when you said he was elected, uh, then, then, well, then then there's no question. This is the point. Yeah. Islam actually the system. What what does Islam no say about no the rule? Islam me hukmaran ke liye ye to kaha gaya hai ki kisi achhe aadmi ko hukmaran banao ye nahi kaha gaya ki usko haral me mard hona chahiye. Aisi koi baat nahi. Yahan par bhi ek vaake ko bilkul misinterpret kiya gaya. और वो नबी सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम का एक तबसरा है जो तारीखी किताबों में बयान हुआ है कोई कुरान का हुक्म नहीं है कोई हुजूर का हुक्म नहीं है कुछ भी नहीं है ये हुक्मरान का मामला ये है कि दो तरीक़ों से अकली और इल्मी तौर पर दो तरीक़ों से बन सकता है खुदा आसमान से फैसला कर दे कि फलां को हुक्मरान बना लो खालिक है मालिक है दुनिया का बादशाह है वो फैसला कर देगा मान लेंगे उसके फैसले का मामला तो मोहम्मद रसोल्ला के साथ ख़त्म हो गया यानी अब वही खत्म हो गई इल्हाम खत्म हो गया अब वो फैसला नहीं होगा दूसरा ये है कि लोग मंतखब करेंगे तो लोग जिसको मंतखब कर लें बस वही हुक्मरान है औरत हो मर्द हो इस्लाम में कोई पाबंदी नहीं है وأمرهم شورى بينهم ومما رزقناهم ينفقون. And those who answer the call of their Lord and establish worship. and whose affairs are a matter of counsel and who spend of what we have bestowed on them whenever the shura decides, decides that this person deserves no to be the ruler, ruler. finish no <laughs> democrat no democrat. so again what was over there yeah. the pakistani society elected no there were no nawaz sharif was over there no yeah. so many other no that even no the religious scholars were there yeah. that, but all of them no were defeated badly by the great lady mm. so majority of the pakistanis they voted for benazir bhutto yeah. and she became no the ruler, ruler. the king so simple that better than us yeah <laughs> really impressive yeah. No, see sure. this is gca you are talking about gca what's that so it's a islamic text on non muslim non muslim no, no, no. for what for, for all the for all the facilities for all the rights for all the protection which the okay. uh, the muslim government will provide for them 
okay. for that. So if we live over there, you know that for example, if we are the Muslims, mm-hmm. you know, and we uh, get settled over there in the non-Muslim state, you know, now th- are we asked to pay some additional tax over there in that country? No. No. So what do you say about that? Yeah, it should be the same. What? <laughs> <laughs> no. So it's we to work on no. it, you know, yeah. whether it's you know that uh, Islamic or non-Islamic. non-Islamic. What kind of that? You no, know, you can say concept. Yeah. Where did it come from? No. Yeah. A lot of authors they write about the idea of jizya and they say that this was an idea that was a non-Muslim tax, right? In reality, the idea of al-jizya was the idea similar to the idea of the visa system today, right? So when you go and live in any, in any country where you're not really from there, you end up paying a yearly fee for a visa, which is, by the way, probably a lot more today in many countries than, than the idea of jizya was. And jizya was dropped for many people as well. I'll give you one story, for example. A man came to Umar ibn Khattab, an old, an old man, and he was going around asking for sadaqah. So he said to, to Umar al-Khattab, said to him, who are you? You know, what are you doing? So he said, I'm an old man and I have to pay for my house and I have to pay for the jizya. And he was a Jewish man living in Medina. So Umar ibn Khattab, he looked at this man and he said, by Allah, we haven't done justice to you. Okay, by Allah, we haven't done justice to you. We have taken from you your jizya when you were, you were younger. And we have wasted your life away as you have gotten older. It was upon us to take care of you if we took money from you just yesterday. So he took him all the way to his house. And he gave him some of the food that he had. And then he went to the Baytul Mal, basically the Ministry of Finance. He went there and he told them that give him a monthly salary and give anyone like him a monthly salary and give him whatever he needs to take care of his family as well and at that moment Umar al-Khattab he stopped the system of jizya from anyone that happened to be poor okay so this was not the system that is described that oh this is a non-muslim tax no you, th- there are people that are dwellers of this land they are not going to be conscripted in war listen to that very carefully they're not going to be conscripted in war so to and they're not they're not invited to be conscripted in war right so Considering that, they pay for the salaries of those people who will protect them at the front, right? Because they're not going to be fighting. They're not going to be conscripted. They're not going to be, they're not going to be expected to do that. And if they get older, as Umar ibn Khattab from the very early advent of Islam, he, he said that we took it from you when you were younger and we're now wasting your life away. Instead, he started giving money back to him, right? So this is really the concept of jizya. It's really misunderstood. There are various misconceptions which prevail regarding Islam and non-Muslims in our society. And amongst these misconceptions is the notion that all non-Muslims are second-rate citizens of an Islamic state. It is generally said that these non-Muslims should be regarded as zimmis and the jizya tax should be imposed on them. Now, I have argued elsewhere and in one of my other lectures that it has to be essentially and very primarily understood that the law of uh, jihad and law of risala, which is clearly mentioned in the Quran, has certain limits and ha- it has certain areas of application which, has, which have to be understood in their proper context. I have already explained elsewhere that in the times of the Prophet Muhammad, as was the case in the times of other messengers of God, the Almighty punished people who deliberately denied the truth. And in fact, he was the person, he was the being who came forward and punished them. The messengers of God and their followers were just weapons in, who he used for this purpose. So therefore, it has to be understood that there, this, this law of the Almighty which is uh, rampant in the Quran, is mentioned in the Quran in, very, in ma- various places, has to be understood in its proper context. Amongst, this issue, amongst these issues is the fact that the Zimmis or, the, or non-Muslims who had become uh, Zim, uh, Zimmis or regarded as Zimmis in the time of the Prophet, they were a special category. And as I said earlier in some, in some of my lectures, that jihad which was waged in the time of the Prophet Muhammad primarily was waged against two people, people of two denominations, people who were mushrik or the polytheists and people who were the Ahl Kitab or the people of the book who were primarily monotheists. Now amongst these monotheists, uh, the people of the book, for them the option was that if they had deliberately denied the truth and the punishment was to be imposed on them, then if they wanted to remain on their own religion, they had to pay the jizya tax and remain subservient to a Muslim government. So it is for these people whom, for whom the jizya tax were imposed. 
Now today, of course, we cannot wage war against non-Muslims because they are on the basis of their kufr. As I said in one of my lectures, this essentially relates to people of the, the time of the prophets of God with whom and for whom it could be pinpointed that they had deliberately denied the truth. Today, we have no means of ascertaining whether a non-Muslim is a kafir or not. And we have also not been given permission to take, um, take up arms against non-Muslims or kuffar. This was only in the time of the messengers of God that it was allowed. And today, it is not allowed. Therefore, it is incorrect to state or say that the non-Muslim citizens of today are zimmis or they are second-grade citizens. A correct word for them would be muahiz. Muahid means a, a citizen, citizenship on the basis of a contract. So a contract has to come into being between uh, uh, the non-Muslim denomination of a Muslim country and with the Muslim country, the government of the Muslim country itself. And these terms of the contract would be any. And on the basis of this, we have to call these non-Muslims as Muahids, citizens on the basis of contract. And they cannot be classified as Zimmis for reasons I have stated earlier. Inshallah. So, gentlemen, really very impressed. Yeah, that's very my, my friend explained many of the points, but one point I think uh, for me, when I, I would think that how Muslim declined, that there was uh, most importantly, they didn't have any political awareness. Absolutely. Because they were uh, just confined to this subcontinent, sure. nobody's going abroad, nobody's seeing what's going on in the world. Uh, uh, in but the, the whole world. But they were yeah. having enough competent uh, person in their cabinet. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Hindus were having enough capable to rule. They True. were having the mind, they have, were having, having good mind. Mm -hmm. True. They were uh, the more, they were the, the one who were consulted more uh, while taking any action. But exactly, that's, that's the, my point, that, that there was no evolution. They are just doing the things within a specific region. Nobody is going out, nobody is coming inside. So how they will know how the world is changing, how to improve, how to be politically modified? Yeah, this, this affected, this the this affected yeah. them in, uh, in the world. Like, like Sir explained that um, there is a hell of a sea all around, all along three sides and nobody is thinking that how to use this. True. So this also impacted in, uh, in the war of uh, independence that uh, the British army was more capable. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were having less number, but they were they were having good technology. That, that's that's my the point. They invaded. They didn't. Through, they, they, they didn't invade through land <laughs> yeah. because they invaded through the sea. If the Muslims are good enough to have at least maybe have a small number of army at the sea, but, but I think they, nobody would look through. aside at the yeah. subcontinent. But they invaded. They invaded with the uh, passage with the, no, with the passage of time or with the intent of the rulers. Yes, uh, they, they had a proper they plan. Permitted, they permitted yeah. them to enter. Okay, do your trade. Because the important thing is first they had a good study of that, okay, what's going this on in the... They have, they have all the information, not they blindly came here and they started invading the, the subcontinent. Uh, unfortunately, no, they were not, you can say they were not updated. Yes. They were not aware of, you know, the surroundings, yes. you know. Yeah. And then these are the questions, Actually, you know. they all were in their, in their internal conflicts. So. Yeah. Yeah. And this all happened after Aurangzeb. True. They were not that uh, capable. Yeah. Before okay. the British were not that capable before, but after Aurangzeb, when they they saw that uh, after the combat of Nadir Shah, no, they exploit simply they exploited the weaknesses of the most yeah. yeah. And you can enlist the weakness number one, two, three, four, exactly. five. They yeah. exploit nothing else. No. Thank you very much, gentlemen. See you tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. कभी हमें एक दूसरे को खोकर भी तो प्यार को ऊंचा दर्जा देते, जुदा रहकर प्यार की ऊंचाइयों को प्राप्त करते. हर प्यार मिलन तो नहीं जुदाई भी तो एक प्यार है